Hello there. My name is Dr. Matthew Leonardi. I'm a gynecologic surgeon and ultrasound specialist from McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. It's a great honor to be speaking to you today about ultrasound for the diagnosis and staging of endometriosis. I would like to thank the organizers of this excellent lineup of speakers, this excellent webinar on endometriosis overall. I really look forward to delivering this, this lecture and to hearing the other talks as well. Here are my disclosures. And if anybody is interested in reaching out to me, either through email at the top of the list here or via any social media platform, you can do so. At the bottom, you can see I have a YouTube channel where I do post some of my content, some of my lectures that I do record and deliver. The outline of the presentation today is to break down the elements of ultrasound for endometriosis. And we're going to use actual ultrasound images and videos to educate all of you on how we can diagnose the disease and how we can stage the disease. Before getting into the actual content of the education, it's really important to understand that not all ultrasound is the same. In general, around the world, there is what we call the basic premise of pelvic ultrasound the assessment of the uterus and the ovaries. Endometriosis is an extrauterine disease. Yes, of course, it can affect and commonly does affect the ovaries, but in many cases, the disease affects the structures outside of those two organs, including the bladder, the bowel, the ligaments. And if they're not assessed as part of the ultrasound, we won't diagnose them. In North America and around the world, most organizations have a very preliminary basic pelvic ultrasound that they recommend to their radiologists, their sonologists, their gynecologists, but we need to push this forward. And through the International Deep Endometriosis Analysis Group, uh, this is a group containing many people from around the world, we have pushed forward the agenda to be able to present a more advanced, comprehensive assessment of the pelvis for endometriosis. Professor George Condis and I have taken the idea statement and looked at the practical integration of assessment with ultrasound for endometriosis in real life. And we have put together this paper, how to perform an ultrasound to diagnose endometriosis for all of you to consider reading and following along. The QR codes throughout the presentation, of course, can allow you to access that content directly by using your smartphone device, of course. The article that we put forward details an approach that actually starts with assessment of the bowel, because the bowel is the structure that we can see on the other side of the vagina as the transvaginal ultrasound probe is entering the vagina. And we can, fo <clears throat> we can follow that bowel up by starting in the retroperitoneal rectum section. We follow that bowel up as high as possible. We then move on to the uterus, followed by the adnexa, and then we break down the areas of the anterior compartment consisting of the bladder, the vesical uterine peritoneum, and the ureters, followed by the rest of the posterior compartment, everything except the bowel, for evaluation of deep endometriosis. There's also the ability to assess for site-specific tenderness, which may be a marker of endometriosis, but may also be a marker of myofascial pelvic floor pain. Though this article doesn't depict it, we have pushed the agenda even further and started to evaluate for superficial endometriosis as well as part of the endometriosis ultrasound assessment. In order to diagnose endometriosis, which is a very complex pathology that can create severe anatomic distortion, we have to understand the normal anatomy on ultrasound. We have to understand the normal anatomy of the structures that we don't look at that commonly, which are often the structures of the posterior compartment. So in this back-to-back -back picture here, surgery and ultrasound, we're seeing the laparoscopic view of a very normal looking pouch of Douglas rectouterine pouch. We have our uterosacral ligaments on tension, those bands. We have the actual pouch and we have the rectum. They're all very normal, very symmetric. In the right image, we have a sagittal view. This is cutting through the uterus 
uh, in this plane, I'm going to throw the laser pointer on here. So we're cutting through the uterus, the cervix, and the pouch in this direction. And this is depicted in the right image here. What we can see is we have the vagina. We have the posterior vaginal fornix extending into the vagina here. We have the rectum, which is depicted by the muscularis layer, which is usually hypoechoic to anechoic. And in between those two structures, we have the true rectovaginal septum. This is an area of the pelvis that is actually quite rarely affected by endometriosis. Most endometriosis is intraperitoneal, affecting the peritoneum overlying the back of the vagina, affecting the rectum. And when the disease is severe, the planes in this space in the pouch become quite distorted and sealed off with severe adhesions. This has traditionally given us the belief, the perception that the disease is in the rectovaginal septum, but in fact, it is often above that area where the true rectovaginal septum begins. In the left image, we have now the overlying yellow uh, depiction here. This reflects the space uh, in the pouch. And in the right image, you can see that there's fluid present here, which is allowing us to separate the planes, which is one of the tools we use to evaluate for superficial endometriosis. The image depicted on the right now obviously shows the very severe state of how endometriosis can completely take over the pelvis with severe obliteration of the pouch. We have the retroflexion of the uterus. Obviously, the suction device is lifting the uterus away right now so we can see that space. We have a dilated right fallopian tube pulled in and under. The bowel is completely stuck to the retrocervix. This is how severe the disease can get. And we need to be able to understand the normal and abnormal to understand the sonographic views. Ovaries are one of the most common places that endometriosis is diagnosed because the assessment of the ovaries is very routine. It's part of the basic pelvic ultrasound that's done all over the world. So one very important lesson that I teach my trainees, my colleagues, is if we have an endometrioma, which is depicted here in this video as a unilocular ground glass echogenic cystic lesion of the ovary. You should not trust that the endometrioma is acting in isolation. There is often going to be deep endometriosis associated with that endometrioma. And by using dynamic ultrasound techniques, including pushing with the probe, pushing with the non-scanning hand, you can assess where the adhesions are. So in this particular case, we have a very severe state of endometriosis with a large uterosacral ligament nodule, and the endometrioma is morbidly adherent to this. We can also appreciate that the uterus is being pulled backwards as well and completely stuck to this area. It's a conglomeration of the posterior uterus being pulled under, the ovary being pulled in, and the deep endometriosis as the root cause of all of those adhesions there. So we should never trust normal ovaries. Endometriomas are a sign of deeper disease. Another lesson that is very important, this is another advanced technique, is to always check for adhesions in the pelvis using those dynamic techniques as well. In this case, here we have a depiction of the sliding sign. And as we can see, this is actually a negative sliding sign, an abnormal state. Negative sliding sign means that there is no sliding between the posterior uterine serosa, retrocervix, and the bowel content behind it. In this case, we also have adhesions of this ovary to the posterior uterine serosa and adhesions all along the entire surface. The non-ultrasound scanning hand is belotting the uterus to try and facilitate that movement there. Assessing for adhesions is not just to help us diagnose the disease, but it is truly there to help us understand surgical complexity. The next tip I have for all of you is to spend your time for deep endometriosis assessment scanning in the posterior fornix. Here's a very rudimentary drawing that I made using PowerPoint, so forgive the amateur drawing, but the 
uh, ultrasound probe needs to spend the time in the space behind the cervix in order to actually see deep endometriosis. Most ultrasound in a patient with an antiverted uterus actually happens in the anterior vaginal fornix, which is a great place for the probe to be if you're assessing the uterus or the ovaries. But if you're trying to assess the area of the pelvis where endometriosis happens the most, which is the posterior compartment, if you're looking through the cervix, the uterus, you're looking through extra layers that are unnecessary. Place the probe behind the cervix, push the uterus and cervix out of the view of your screen, and spend your time evaluating this space just here. When you're in that space, the way to evaluate the bowel is to follow the black line. Find that muscularis layer in the retroperitoneum as the probe is entering the vagina. This is the layer here. And as you move the probe into the vagina progressively and into the posterior vaginal fornix progressively, you can follow this line higher and higher and higher. This is a normal rectum that's being depicted in this video in comparison to here, where we follow that black line. We'll see it again, just in the middle, right here to an area of dense adhesion, bowel endometriosis. As the probe sweeps just lateral to that bowel nodule, we start to see an endometrioma and uterosacral ligament disease. We can appreciate as well instantly as the probe has entered into the vagina within a few seconds that this is a very severe state of endometriosis. So follow the black line and find the hypoechoic nodule of the rectum. This is the still image of that particular case depicting that deep endometriosis nodule. When we're talking about the uterosacral ligaments in the posterior vaginal fornix in the posterior compartment, we want to follow the white line. The follow the white line technique allows us to start the scan in the midline where we can evaluate the peritoneum overlying the back of the vagina. And as we lateralize the probe, we see this white line thicken. This is the uterosacral ligament. In this case, we have the uh, angling of the probe, the rotation of the probe, we have an angling that is uh, going to be counterclockwise for the patient's uh, right uterosacral ligament and counterclockwise for the patient's left uterosacral ligament. And when we're in that space and we're trying to watch the white line, we can look for hypochoic nodules again in that white line, bam, right there, right here. As that probe is lateralizing, we're following that white line, following it laterally, laterally to the uterosacral ligaments, and then we see a hypoechoic nodule in the uterosacral ligament. It's very easy to diagnose once you get the probe in the right place and you have the right movements. Some technical settings would be to decrease the depth of your penetration, to move your focal point up, and make sure that your contrast is appropriate to have nice, soft views. Another very important step in evaluating endometriosis patients is to evaluate for hydroureter. In order to evaluate for hydroureter, which can be caused by a deep nodule in the parametrium, in the uterosacral ligament, we need to find the ureters. When we find the ureters, we should always start centrally at the bladder base, and we should lateralize our probe to where the ureters exist in the retroperitoneum pelvic sidewall. We can watch the dilation of the ureter through the vermiculation process, and we can measure the ureter if we have a concern for hydroureter. Usually a measurement of less than six millimeters is considered to be normal, but more often than not, abnormal ureters are going to have a narrow aspect and then a dilated aspect because there is usually going to be a focal point of obstruction, which we will see in this video here. So I'll outline the ureter and I'll outline the nodule. We have the distal ureter here and the proximal ureter here with a parametrial nodule that is blocking the ureter in this specific location. This is a patient who had also hydronephrosis, hydroureter and hydronephrosis and slowly declining kidney function. In addition to lots of endometriosis symptoms, bowel symptoms from bowel endometriosis, this was a very severe state. 
So by assessing the ureters systematically, routinely on every scan, you actually can pick up hydrouretor, which completely changes the game in your surgical approach to this patient, as you may need to bring in a urologist to do a ureteral resection and reimplantation if it's not something that you do as a gynecologist. So that's lots of tips that I've put forward for you to understand how to diagnose endometriosis and how to understand the severity of the disease. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Again, if anybody would like to connect, here are my social media channels. And I would like to also encourage, if you're not already registered, to consider registering for the World Congress on Endometriosis to be held this year in Edinburgh from the 3rd to 6th of May. I'll be there along with many experts of endometriosis around the world and look forward to connecting at that time. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.